let's talk about her conversion then. We we certainly can't can't leave without doing that. Um, this began sort of in the 1950s when she was working in Europe, correct? Yeah, so Mary Lou goes to Europe at the end of 1952 and she thinks she's going to go for a two week tour and she ends up staying in Europe for two years. Um, and I think partially because she finds she, she didn't, doesn't really realize until she goes there that she has a fan base there and there's there's a record label there that called Vogue that wants to record her I mean and she's getting right. write-ups in the jazz magazine and Melody Maker um, so but it's while she's there uh, she's mainly in England and France and it's while she's in Paris uh, that she really starts questioning uh, if really if she should be doing music at all because she's someone you know one thing we haven't talked about that is a huge part of Mary Lou's life is she was someone who was always very compassionate and she was always seeking to help people who she saw were in need so I mean she was bringing people into her apartment and who had uh, financial issues who had drug addictions she was giving away her pay at Cafe Society when there was someone who needed money. Um, and basically, uh, she really starts thinking that maybe she needs to tend to people's needs in a really practical way like that. And she's not sure that she's doing enough if she's doing music. And she also is seeing uh, a lot of musicians around her who are struggling with things like heroin addiction. Um, have i mean die in some cases from it so like charlie parker when she comes back from europe in 1954 charlie parker dies several months afterwards uh, of heroin addiction uh mm -hmm. and i mean so in in paris one of her closest friends a pianist named garland wilson uh dies and it's while she's there that she just starts questioning so uh, one of her fans, who is a devout Catholic, a guy named Colonel Edward Brennan, shows her uh, a a garden uh, where there's a statue of the Virgin Mary, and she starts praying there. And uh, she even talks about in an article uh, she wrote for Sepia magazine that she just she basically just you know asks God what she's supposed to do and she said she had never felt close to God before so when she comes back uh, to the states she starts looking for a church and for a while she tries going to Abyssinian Baptist Church in Harlem which is a humongous church um, where Adam Clayton Powell Jr. who was married to Hazel Scott but at this point they're divorced uh, was the pastor and I really think Mary Lou um, didn't stay at Abyssinian because I think she needed a place that was just more quiet. Um, hmm. And so she finds a Catholic church in her neighborhood called Our Lady of Lourdes that keeps its doors open during the daytime. So she starts going there during the day just to be in silence. And then she starts going to mass there. And uh, she eventually, this is also a period where she, she has decided that she needs to give up public performance. So she basically turns down most of the gig offers she receives. The one place that she does play piano sometimes is at Our Lady of Lourdes in the basement. Uh, and she offers to actually do, I don't think these ever happen, but there's a letter she wrote to the parish priest offering to do do some concerts like for youth uh so she you know but she was basically her life was going to church and praying for as many people as she could she made a prayer list that got up to 900 names of people she tried to name individually in her prayer every day mm -hmm. so that took hours and hours and hours so between doing that and then going home and trying to take care of whoever she was bringing into her apartment at the time, trying to nurse them back to health or 
just help them out in whatever way she could. I mean, she was, she had a very ascetic lifestyle. Yeah. Yeah. It's very striking. You know, I was kind of amazed reading that about Our Lady of Lourdes because I've lived in Harlem for eight and a half years in two different apartments and my previous place uh, near City College on 139th in Amsterdam, I used to go to Our Lady of Lourdes multiple times a week for daily mass. Yeah. Um, but I never, and I knew that Sugar Hill, that area, a lot of great jazz musicians lived there, but I never knew about Mary Lou Williams, much less that she had attempted to take Bud Powell and Thelonious Monk mm -hmm. to mass mm -hmm. at Our Lady of Lourdes. Mm -hmm. But yeah, I used to go there all the time. So that was wow. pretty cool to learn that she, yeah, she went neat. there. I also wanted to ask you about her kind of like her mystical aspects, because you mentioned that she, she had some kind of vision of Mary or something when she was in well, Europe this is before so, she became Catholic? So Mary Lou had visions throughout her life. I mean, so when she was born, so uh, in African-American culture and W.E.B. Du Bois writes about this, uh, when a child was born with a part of the placenta over their face, it was called a veil. And Mary Lou was born with a veil. And in African-American culture, that meant she had a gift of, of second sight or being able to, to see right. things. And, and she very much uh, believed this. And she talked about visions that she had when she was small, visions that she had. I mean, yeah, she, she has a vision of uh, Virgin Mary while she's in Europe. Um, later on, after uh, in the early 60s, when so St. Martin de Porres is, is, is being considered for canonization uh, and she, she learns about him. She talks about having, uh, well, and also later in her life when she's, she's very ill uh, and in the hospital, she talks uh, about having visions of St. Martin de Porres standing at the end wow. of her bed and speaking with her. And um, so for her, that was something that was, an, uh, I don't want to say common, but it, it wasn't super um, rare. Uh, so, so yeah, she was, she was someone who uh, saw things that other people did not see. I think we skipped over a little. I mean, I know we don't have much time, but you know how she even became Catholic because <laughs> oh, we sorry. got to I her going of, yeah. to Lourdes, yeah, go ahead. you sorry. know, but I mean, basically it's, the interesting thing to me is that it's through people not noticing that they don't see Mary Lou on the scene anymore. That's part of um, how these people come around her. So Dizzy Gillespie, uh, who we've mentioned, who was a good friend of Mary Lou's, he and his wife, Lorraine, are in Latin America in Paraguay. And Dizzy Gillespie is on uh, a uh, U.S. cultural ambassadors tour that happened a lot in the 1950s. And he's there with his big band and a redemptorist priest who's a big fan of Dizzy's who's stationed in Mato Grosso, Brazil, comes to hear him. And his name is Father John Crowley. And he's an amateur saxophonist. And he had also, uh, he was super into jazz and had, uh, in fact, a subscription to Metronome magazine, which was a jazz magazine that Barry Ulanoff was the editor of. I've seen letters that John Crowley wrote to Barry Yulinov from Brazil basically saying, hi, I need to renew my subscription and I'm a priest and mm -hmm. I'm into jazz, but I'm not sure that, you know, this is okay, but whatever. So, <laughs> so actually Crowley is the one who talks to Gillespie and says, hey, I've noticed that I haven't heard anything about Mary Lou Williams for a few years, you know, what's going on. And so Crowley, you know, uh, several months later, he comes back to the States for a visit and it's Dizzy's wife, Lorraine, who gets him to visit Mary. So because she's concerned about Mary. So so Crowley is the first priest who comes to her apartment, who sees that she's, you know, taking care of, of lots of different kinds of people and says, you know, you, you shouldn't be doing this. This isn't a safe thing to do. And it doesn't necessarily stop her. But he's also the first priest she's met who understands uh, her attraction uh, to uh, faith, to Catholicism, and also understands uh, her love of jazz. So it's right. kind of really, you know, through that and then uh, that 
she meets uh, Father Anthony Woods, who is the the biggest influence, uh, spiritual influence in her life, who was priest at St. Francis Xavier and St. Ignatius Loyola in New York. Um, and she does convert to Catholicism in 1957 with Lorraine uh, and, and Gillespie and both of them at St. Ignatius, which is pretty amazing. If you, if you know St. Ignatius in New York, it's like the church is like a block long. It's on the Upper East Side. It's super wealthy. Yeah, I've been to a concert. It's super there. white. Yeah. Um, just blunt. Uh, so to think of these two African American women being received into the church at St. Ignatius really, to me, shows. I mean, one of the things that it shows is that, you know, Mary, when she decided to do something, I mean, she just went forward with it and that's how she was in her whole life 